right. This morning we're going to be talking about technical session number 38. And just a reminder, we always jump around a little bit with regards to T sessions. And anything below T31 is 1101. Anything above T32 is 1102. I know we're kind of mixing and matching a little bit right now. But that will get uh, cleared up here in a little bit. <clears throat> and we're trying to kind of pair all this stuff up. So we're talking about the same things at the same times. So but today we are going to be getting into troubleshooting windows. And our main objective for this particular technical session is going to be identifying common issues that come up with windows and common troubleshooting applications to use when diagnosing the issue. Uh, describe how to resolve these common issues using the appropriate troubleshooting tools and a name which system utility, administrative tool, or command line to use for given scenarios. So we talked about a lot of these various little functions before, started talking about the command line a little bit. Now we're going to be talking about appropriate use of these tools. For this particular technical session, I want to keep in mind behavior, skills, persistence, because that is probably one of your greatest um, attributes with regards to troubleshooting. <clears throat> because we want to try to follow things to their solution. Even if we are unable to resolve the issue for the customer, take the time later to follow up and find out what exactly the problem was. So the next time you see that issue, you're able to address it and not have to struggle with it a little bit more, but it inevitably you're adding another tool to your toolbox. Like I said, every problem we can solve is a tool in our toolbox. <clears throat> the more tools we have, the more valuable we become. And also teamwork. IT team or IT is very, very much a team sport. And on each team, you're going to have varying skill sets. Some are going to be better at telecom, some are going to be better at networking, some are going to be better at security, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And you want to be able to utilize your team as efficiently as possible so that you are able to solve the problems that you are addressed with in a timely manner. But it also lends opportunities for cross training and development so that you can develop new skills. Again, nobody is ever the pinnacle of all knowledge that is IT. It just doesn't exist. There's nobody out there that is that. So in many cases, we do specialize, but it is always valuable to have base knowledges in other um, skill sets because you may not be able to, you know, be the most awesome at it but at least you can be proficient and solve the problems that you need to, even if it's outside of your silo of knowledge. All right, so overview. Justin Cox, can you please read first, sir? Take my mute off. Uh, problems with an operating system usually affect the overall operation of the computer. Learning how to identify and troubleshoot some of the most common operate, uh, operating system issues is a huge percentage of what PC repair techs do on a daily basis. Software is complex and multifaceted. Additionally, there are many places where things can go wrong. This makes operating systems one of the most confusing components to troubleshoot. With a proper plan of action and a good backup, you can approach these problems with confidence. Awesome. Thank you. So what should our what should our first step not be when approaching a software problem? Wipe the hard drive. There you go. Wipe the hard drive. That's most invasive, right? So and, and Justin put the king method. What should our approach be in general? When we're trying to troubleshoot or solve problems. Uh, 
and two people talking at once kind of threw me off. You want to start with yeah. some simple problem first? Least invasive option first, right? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's like if you go to your doctor and say, you know, I think I got a little a little bit of chest pain, you know, you don't want the first thing to do be like, all right, let's crack his chest and get in there and take a look. No, you're like, maybe we should try an antacid first. It may be harder. <clears throat> Least invasive first. All right, so common symptoms that we're gonna be talking about over the course of this uh, technical session. And we're going to get into some of the troubleshooting methods and uh, possible solutions. We're going to be talking about proprietary crash screens, also known as the blue screen of death or BSOD errors. We're talking about failure to boot, improper shutdowns, spontaneous shutdown and restart, uh, device fails to start, or the drives or operating system is not detected, missing DLL message or dynamic link library. Uh, services fail to start, compatibility errors, slow system performance, which is one of the more obscure ones to deal with because there's a multitude of reasons that can cause it, as well as being a subjective experience. And then finally, getting into some application issues. So first, blue screen of death. It does not quite look like this anymore now it kind of gives you a qr code so you can take a picture of the qr code and it'll give you the error and it'll tell you uh basically some critical error has occurred here is a code that will tell you you know likely what happened <clears throat> now most people just see blue screen death like oh man restart but for us that blue screen provides us valuable information. So it'll tell us what's having an issue and we can go to it and that'll lead us to how we would address that issue as well. Um, however, in some companies, especially when you're dealing with um, public facing web servers and stuff like that, they eliminate a lot of these codes, error codes, and they use what are called generic codes. And they do this for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of the main ones being that hackers can actually, will actually intentionally try to force an error because once they force an error, if they can get a specific code back, once they have that specific code, they know what type of system you're using. So they know if you're using a Cisco systems, you know, they can even probably get down to make and model based on that error code that you get. And once they have that, they would know how to attack known vulnerabilities. So in order to kind of counteract this, they will set up a system of just using generic codes. So this is gonna be in larger companies, typically not medium to small size companies. For the most part, when you see this, um, it is going to give you a code that's gonna lead you directly to the error that you, um, or what it is exactly that's going wrong. Sometimes it goes by quick. Um, I've had incidents where it's up on the screen for less than a second. Handy tip, when you start up the computer, record it with your phone. And so when it flashes on the screen and it's there for less than a second, you have the recording, you can go back, pause the video and then see what the error code is. So helpful tip. <clears throat> All right, here's the Microsoft website where you can kind of go and you can check for errors and stuff based upon the B, you know, the BSOD errors. Um, Just a handy site to go and do research if you need it. Here's some examples of errors that you might come across. So inaccessible boot drive device. It's likely a you know missing driver. At that point, you just need to update or install it. It could also be virus or malware. So you need to quarantine and then run your, your virus scan. Uh, we'll get into what's called malware remediation in a couple of weeks. And there are seven steps to malware remediation. And yes, we have to be very familiar with those. They love asking about it on 1102. Um, 
unexpected kernel mode trap, the hardware error, uninstall and reinstall the device drivers typically will help. Um, fans not working, or maybe, maybe if you just installed a CPU, you didn't put the thermal paste on. NTFS file system, you know, so a variety of these we'll be getting into as we go, but this is just kind of giving you some examples of errors you'll see, what it means, and possible solutions or places to start troubleshooting. All right, tools that we use to research or troubleshoot BSOT errors. First one, search out the error code. Like, so it gives you an error code right off the bat. Awesome. Go look it up. Go to Microsoft's website. See what the, the BSOT errors means. <clears throat> the other thing is Event Viewer. Does anybody remember what Event Viewer does? Like, what is the main importance of Event Viewer? What is kept there? Like a log of, of the error? Logs, right? Everything we do, everything we touch, everything we interact with, everything we open, there's a log of it, right? So based upon this error, we can go to Event Viewer, which is where all the logs are kept for that computer. And we can look through the logs and see what happened right before that error occurred. So a little bit of detective work. Other things we may wish to do, go to Windows Updates and check and see if any patches have come out because maybe there was a recent update and that recent update has a common um, effect of this error happening. So go look and see if any patches or hot fixes have been released recently to take care of the same problem that you're dealing with. <clears throat> if you have installed something recently and they don't have any patches out, but you're having this problem, system restore. We can roll back the clock on what we just did with regards to drivers and system files and all that fun stuff. So go backwards in time a little bit. Memory diagnostics tool, just to check and see if our system memory is <clears throat> functioning as it should. We're getting memory errors. And the other one we can use is check disk to look at our hard drive and see if, we're having, if we have any corrupted sectors on our drive, or side, you know, pieces that no longer work. So these are just a, a starting point of tools where you can start looking for the problem and seeing what may be the root cause and or some possible solutions. So first things first, check the code, look it up. Next, go look at our logs. Check the events that happened just before. Update your patches. If there are no patches and you just ran some updates and that's what started the problem, do a system restore to undo what you did. Roll back the clock. And then check your memory diagnostics and then your hard drive for any bad sectors, so to speak. Questions on this? The system restore also affect app um, updates? Yes. So you can roll back updates on applications, yes. Drivers, we can roll it back the individual drivers, thankfully, but uh, system restore would be a little bit more towards uh, like system patches, um, service packs and applications and stuff like that. And we can roll back from there. All right, other things we can do after we've done a lot of that stuff. We already talked about the BOSOT error where we get the, we do the restart. You can see it. If you made any changes, hardware or software, don't, don't discount hardware as well. So if we made any recent changes, undo any of those changes and see if that undoes the problem. It may be the device is faulty. It may be the patch is bad. So undo what you just did. <clears throat> if it's a device driver, you can use Windows Explorer to kind of locate the program listed. And you can use Windows Explorer to locate the program file. And then you can try either uninstalling and reinstalling it. 
Um, and if that doesn't work, um, look and see if any recent patches, or you may have to roll back to a previous version and utilize that until a new patch comes at, out. Also look in your action center. Remember, where's the action center located? Anybody remember there's two names for it? Where's our action center located? Bottom right corner. Bottom right. Corner. Bottom right corner. What do we call that fantastical area? Taskbar. Taskbar. Well, it's on the taskbar, yes, but there is a specific name we use for that bottom right corner. Notification, notification area. There we go. That's one name. What's the other name? Notification center. So notification area, and then what's the other one? Power and shutdown area. Power no, no. No, all right, that's going to be taskbar. It's on the taskbar, yes. System tray. There we go, system tray. So notification area or system tray. Um, your action center is located right there. And how do we identify the action center? What does it look like? We know where it is. What does it look like? Everybody's like looking on the computer. Some small like little, yeah, it's like a little flag, right? When it's red, there's a problem. So go there, look at some of your archive messages from your system uh, for your notification area and see if there was any emergencies that we may have missed. All right. So failure to boot. So if a system fails to boot, we need to determine whether it is hardware or software. General rule, if you just installed something or just changed something on the hardware, it's likely hardware related. So you need to go back, check your connections, make sure everything is seated properly, especially if you're dealing with RAM and then uh, try to start it up that way. If you can at least get past those annoying beeps, what are those beeps called? Post. Post, excellent. What does that stand for? Power on self-test. Power on self-test, excellent. So we get past post and we get to something like this where it's, you know, system not found, then we would go to our BIOS. Make sure we're seeing all our hardware, all that fun stuff. If the operating system hasn't even started, it may not be able to communicate with the hard drive. Or if it's a brand new hard drive that we put in, it doesn't have an operating system on it yet. So we got to install one, right? So we want to make sure in the BIOS, the boot order is set up properly. What do we mean by boot order? So when I say boot order, what do I mean? Uh, what boots up first uh, with the OS? Okay. How do you mean? So, for instance, if you have hard drive one and hard drive two, and hard drive two has your uh, like everything on it in your main uh, OS, mm -hmm. you'll want to swap hard drive one from the first thing that boots to hot, uh, hard drive two. Knocking on the right doors. Close. So if hard drive two doesn't have, or if hard drive one doesn't have an operating system on, it's gonna to move to the next item on the list, right? So, and these items can include USB, optical drives, hard drives. Am I missing anything? SSD. SSD. Anything else? Think thin client. What do I mean when I say thin client? 
Well, all that like the SSD and hard and hard drive and all that stuff would fall under basically a hard drive. But I like we we're going on that. So we got USB, optical, hard drive, or SSD, what have you. Anywhere else we might look for an operating system. Network boot. <clears throat> what was that, Kurt? Network boot. Network boot. So we would need a address to kind of connect to another system, right? <clears throat> so all of these may be set up and there may be a hierarchical order. So like you may say, I want you to look for optical drive first, USB second, hard drive third. If none of those are present, please go to this web address and look for a operating system there. Now in an enterprise setting, hopefully, um, you will turn off the USB aspect of this because this is one of the most common ways hackers will try to break into systems is through USBs. So you want to disable what's called auto run and you want to remove it from the boot sequence. But so if we if we're getting this, it may be that like Brandon was saying, we installed in hard drive two and hard drive two has our operating system, right? But we go to our boot order and our boot order is optical drive, USB, hard drive one, and that's it. So where we have our operating system stored is not even in the list to go looking for it. So we would need to go check our boot order and make sure that the appropriate drive is actually in that cycle. So historically speaking, why would they put optical drive above hard drive? Why wouldn't we just go to the hard drive first? Think about what do you do when your system crashes? Installation, very good. Uh, Windows recovery installations. So you'd want it to go to the, the optical drive first because if you had a problem with your main hard drive and then it's got to go past that to get to the optical drive, it's still going to try to go to the main drive first. So if we have optical drive set first, if we put in a recovery disk or something like that, it would try to run that first. And that gives us the option. So that's historically why they would do it. Although, as we are aware, um, optical drives are kind of being legacied out for the most part. Yes, correct, Jose. All right, lost my mouse. <clears throat> so if the hard drive isn't booting because the, oh, the operating system itself is corrupt, like Jose was just mentioning, uh, we would need to access the Windows recovery environment or WinRe. So a couple ways we can reach this, we can use Windows installation media. This would be like an optical disk. And when we put it in, it'll say what kind of install do we want to make? Do we want to do an upgrade? Do we want to do a clean install? Or would we like to do a repair? And when we click repair, that would get us into the Windows recovery environments, which we'll show a picture of that here in just a minute. <clears throat> the other, we can use the repair option on your computer. Repair, uh, repair your computer option, excuse me, talking is hard, um, on the advanced boot option, and that would boot you into the Windows recovery environment, or you can use a system repair disk, which was created before the problems. Anybody ever do an install, or when they started up a brand new computer, all that stuff, you need to go through those questions, and would like, it, at the very end, it asks you a question, would you like to create a system repair disk? So back in the day, again, they don't, you know, if we did it now, it'd probably be a USB, but we could also go to the Windows website, Service Center, and create one of those on USB if we wish. <clears throat> so Mac OS has their own recovery tool called OS X Recovery. 
enables it to kind of rebuild the Mac with a reboot and key combination. We get there at command R at boot to access the recovery environment. And you can kind of do a factory reset if you wish. But there is also other stuff you can use in there to try to troubleshoot before, before you do the king method. Uh, Linux, uh, they have two different boot managers. They have Grub and Lilo. And Grub tends to be hands down the most common. Um, but if Grub gets corrupted or deleted, Linux won't start. And, you know, it'll say you're missing your Grubs. All right. This is what the Winry looks like. Um, it is slightly different now. I believe this is a Windows 7 or Windows 10 version. So you have your system restore, which you can kind of uh, set it up to basically like a fast factory reset. You can recover an image if you already have an image that you've created with all your settings and answer file and all that fun stuff. Um, you can do a startup repair, which will go look for missing, damaged, or corrupted files and go ahead and put those in. You can do your startup settings. So if you want to uh, start into safe mode, which none of the drivers, none of the fancy stuff is loaded up and it looks like a old version, very old version of Windows when you boot it up, almost like it's 8-bit Nintendo graphics. <clears throat> but it gives you the ability to turn things on one at a time and try to figure out what your problems are. So the uh, safe boot is really good for troubleshooting. You can go back to a previous version or utilize the command prompts. Now on the 1101, there is likely going to be a um, performance-based question or simulation where you're gonna have to do a Windows repair. You're gonna have to get into the Windows recovery environment and then you're gonna have to use um, the command prompt to fix your boot record. So we're gonna prepare you ahead of time for this. Uh, I had to do this one when I went through the A plus and I spent 15 minutes on it because I could not remember the final command. Good news is they give you partial credits. Bad news is I missed the final step, but still was able to pass. But there was just one command that I could not remember and I tried 50 different commands. But to this day, after that, I have not forgotten that command. So, but we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, if you put your Windows recovery disk in, it would look something like this, where you can kind of run your install, or you can go into repair your computer, which would get you into that Windows recovery environment. Obviously, this is an older version of it, but similar starts up until Windows 10. All right. Uh, some symptoms you may get for improper shutdowns. <clears throat> Sometimes you get what's called a rogue system, which will begin shutting down and restarting while in use. This can be symptomatic of viruses. Um, it also can be symptoms of hardware problems, and it can also be settings misconfiguration. So there's a variety of reasons why your systems will, you know, automatically starting to start to shut down and restart and maybe doing this multiple times. Hardware issues that can cause this, RAM. If your RAM gets overloaded and you don't have, or and your virtual memory gets overloaded, it can cause the system to crash. Motherboard, although this one is very rare. CPU, if it's overheating, it'll start shutting things down. Video cards. If they don't have updated drivers, all that kind of fun stuff, same thing. And then system overheating, if your fans aren't turning on um, or what have you, that can cause that. So how do we figure this out? Where do we go look for these? Go to Event Viewer, check our logs, look for hardware failures. See if it can point us in the right direction. What happened right before the crash? Apply any Windows patches. This may um, correct issues with motherboard or CPU. Use memory diagnostics to check your memory. Check disk to see if your hard drive has any bad sectors. 
<clears throat> Overheating is suspected. Go check your BIOS and see, or hopefully your UEFI at this point, and see the temperature of the CPU. Should not get over 38 degrees Celsius on average. If you're getting much above that, it means you're cooling, you're not cooling efficiently. You could have dried thermal paste on there. You may have not put it on there properly, or the fan over the CPU may not be functioning properly. There's a multitude of reasons. If you have liquid cooling, bad thing about liquid cooling is it's quiet. It's also the good thing about liquid cooling. But the bad part about that is, is when a fan stops working, we have an audible um, indicator that it's not functioning. Liquid cooling stops functioning, doesn't make a sound until it overheats. Kind of like the radiator in your car, you just all of a sudden start getting temperature warnings. So, we would go check the BIOS and see if we're having temperature issues with our CPU. All right, endless shutdown and restarts. Um, if this is the case, boot into safe mode where you can go change your Windows settings. And, um, you know, this is what would control your automatic restart. You can also go to your startup menu and change what is being started up when your system starts. Again, when we install new software in our computer, more often than not, they go ahead and just add themselves to our startup menu. So they can be ready and going at our convenience. Unfortunately, over time, this clogs it down, makes it more difficult and slows things down drastically. And if too much is there, it can cause the system to start crashing, especially if there's a problem with that particular program. All right. Dry or device failed to start or not detected. This is typically driver related, although it would not be out of the um, realm of possibility to go back in and check your connections if it is a hardware device that you have installed. Um, so the three most common tabs on your properties for your device manager are your general, your driver, and your resources. So general is basically your device type, who made it, where it's located, also uh, gives you some other information whether or not it's working properly. So good place to start for troubleshooting. Drivers, we've done the labs on this one. You go in, you update your drivers. If drivers cause other issues, we roll back drivers. Uh, the five common buttons you'll see on this would be uninstall the driver, update the driver, or roll back the driver. So when we have a issue with it, we can go look and see if there's anything that needs to be updated. If we just updated it, Roll it back. If neither of those work, uninstall and reinstall it. All right. So resources kind of lets you know what, what system resources are being utilized by this, your input, output, um, variety of others, and then whether there are conflicts with these. All right, let's see here. Uh, Jose, can you read first, please? Yeah. Um, if the problem is with the device driver, an updated driver version can be found on the device manufacturer website. Be careful to download and install the proper driver for the OS. The most common driver related device issue and a device failure when the new driver is installed. If this occurs, you can use the rollback driver option in device manager or boot into the last known good configuration. Very good. Thank you. There we go. Here's a quick look at a troubleshooting report you may get. <clears throat> we have another one here. Yep, there we go. So basically what it looks like if you're doing a troubleshooting report using the Windows troubleshoot. Although 
of times it looks more like my background. Uh, missing DLL or dynamic link library. Nice thing about this is it will indicate exactly which file is missing. That's the beautiful part about it. <clears throat> so these files are shared by a variety of systems on your computer. If they are missing, corrupted, um, you'll receive messages whenever you try to do something that requires that file. So if that file is missing or corrupted, the nice thing is you can go to a functioning system that is on the same service pack as you and make note of the name of the file and its location. Then you can copy that same file from another system, bring it over and place it in the same location as the one that's missing or corrupted. And this will um, resolve that issue. Typically we try not to mess with the DLL files, but if you have one missing or corrupted, this is a way to fix it. I think Coursera may actually have a lab on this. Sorry, what is DLL again? Dynamic Link Library. Okay. Group of system files. All right. So missing DLL messages. <clears throat> so basically many of these, many of the applications that we use share common small programs or components that serve the main programs. They often have what's called a DLL extension or dynamic link library, which kind of lets everybody know where things are located. It's kind of like the card catalog uh, for those of us who remember what one of those are in the Dewey Decimal System. Uh, for system files and stuff like that. Um, so when you get one of these messages, you can try reinstalling the application. You can recover it from a backup application on the system files. You can try to go retrieve that file and place it in its proper location from another system. And that also helps. <clears throat> and then the other thing is, is the component, the relationship between that main program and the component it's trying to talk to might be broken. And that does happen from time to time. <clears throat> Microsoft has a snap in uh, called, uh, was it Microsoft, or excuse me, Component Services. And this will allow you to register these components and also give possible solutions on solving them. Older versions might have, it's called the REG SVR. 32.exe, this is going to be for your 32-bit uh, architecture. And you can use that to register components if need be. Because not all things ever manufactured are listed on your computer. That's why sometimes when we have certain components we're installing or applications, they come with a install disk or an install USB. Your most common stuff, they actually have a list of basic drivers like HP printers, um scanners microphones all that stuff they will have a basic set of drivers to get initial communication going and then you can download the other drivers from the internet at that point <clears throat> questions so far all right All right, service fails to start can be caused by either resource conflicts, like if X amount of RAM is required to run said program. So when they say minimum RAM, um, four gigs of RAM or something like that, if you have, say, six gigs of RAM on your computer and you have two programs with a minimum RAM requirement of four. Then. Um, there will be a conflict of resources, meaning it doesn't have enough to run both. <clears throat> Maybe on a different screen, Andrew. First place to start looking, obviously, in this, go check our logs. Got to be a little bit like a detective in that sense. Go in, look, see what happened, what occurred right before it. Um, look at Service Control Manager and see if you had a run out of memory error. 
Um, check the service console to make sure the service is set to start automatically. And then it could be basic solution one, either you're gonna require more resources if it's a memory issue, or you may have to uninstall and reinstall the program because it may not have installed properly. With regards to applications, this tends to be one of the most common solutions. Like once you have your data saved and all that fun stuff is to uninstall and reinstall the application because it tends to correct a huge portion of issues. It's, it's almost to the level of, have you tried turning it on and off again? So if you have an app like on your phone, if an application isn't functioning properly, try deleting the application and reinstalling it. That tends to solve a lot of the issues. All right. Compatibility errors. Some of us have older thing, you know, older components or hardware that we just can't give, you know, get ourselves to just let go of. I think I had a mouse that I used for like 20 years. Same mouse. It's a P2 connector trackball they didn't make the trackball like that anymore it worked awesome i used it with every system but more recently compatibility errors because it was such old hardware it wasn't able to really talk to the newer stuff um but for types of software this is really big with regards to the um Windows XP crowd, especially in companies, because XP had both the benefit of being uh, in play when the widest adoption of computer, like the you know, office computer usage, as well as being far more stable than its predecessors. So when you combine those two things, companies basically latched onto it and did not want to get rid of it at that point. So a lot of applications were developed to work on XP. And programmers retire, um, companies go out of business, and you know the companies that create the software or what have you, and, and businesses are still using them, even beyond what's called their end of life cycle. But they're not able to function with more modern systems, so we have to utilize essentially plugins or simulations, emulators, so to speak of older versions of these systems in order to run these applications or programs or hardware. So Windows 7, 8, 8.1 and 10 all had which, you know, a, a emulator that where you could open applications and run them in XP mode. So they would think that they're being run in XP so they would still be able to function even though you're operating on newer systems. So this allowed to expand or extend the life of said programs even beyond um, the lack of support for their original operating systems. Issues still arise with regards to security on this uh, because the reason you can't use XP anymore is because of a lack of security support. But now if you have applications which are being updated and all that stuff, you have security issues with them as well. Questions on that? All right. So let me pause right here. So other symptoms we want to keep in mind, slow performance. As we said, this one is kind of a, uh, a tough one because it's it can be very subjective my system is running so much slower than it has before and sometimes we associate new and shiny with running faster i don't know if any of y'all ever seen it where they they uh they do this in new york or whatever they'll go and they'll say hey uh, we want to give you a opportunity to try out the new iPhone or whatever it is. You can turn in your old one and uh, use the new one or what have you. And what they do is they basically take their 
their old phone, pull it out of the case, clean it, and then hand it back to them. Same phone. And they're like, okay, we're just going to switch all your stuff over to your new phone. So it'll be like a regular setting and da 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 da. And people get their hands on it. And because it's out of the case, they're like, oh, it's a much more sleek and slim design. It doesn't feel so bulky and clunky like my old phone because I have it in a big protective case. And uh, they're just sitting there and they start going through. It's like, man, and the apps load so much faster. My old phone is so slow because they're instantly associating new and shiny with running faster. So there's a subjectivity to it. Um, prior to, you know, getting my hands on a second, another like secondhand phone or whatever, the phone I had prior to this one, which I got this one like uh, about a year ago, uh, the phone I had was older than my oldest son because it continued to work. Um, but some people, they want the new hotness every year. I want the new phone, the new, the, the bigger, faster, better, most recent thing. But yeah, placebo effect. You tell something is new and you know new and awesome, and you want to believe it. It's more so if you've spent money on it because you don't want to think that you made a bad purchase. So, because you have invested into it and you have skin in the game, so to speak, you want to believe that it is working better or faster or whatnot. <clears throat> so, again, there is some subjectivity there. company I used to work for, we use a lot of laptops and the new laptops in the company, the new ones were 10 years old. So because they were all older and all that kind of fun stuff, there was always that impression that, oh, they're just terrible. They don't run as good. They're slow. Da, 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 da. And sometimes that was the case, but not always. But if there is a potential instance, one of the first things we want to do if we're getting a symptom of general slowness is kind of run a baseline. You know, we can run a program to see, you know, how much RAM is being used. Um, you can actually run and see, um, you know, how, how fast the processor is moving and all that kind of fun stuff. And if it's running below what we would think is a normal standard, then, okay, we want to check and see if we got any viruses. So it happens. <clears throat> if the hard disk, this is much easier to tell on a old school mechanical drive than it is on an S SD drive, because what happens is, is they call it drive thrashing. So where you'll hear that drive just going, and it's just continually reading and writing from the drive, and it's just moving a whole lot, and this keeps happening. So you have an, essentially an overabundance of disk activity without you really opening up a lot of programs. Um, at that point, you would want to run a virus scan. And here's the kicker. You want to have a virus scanner available either on a CD or DVD or a memory stick. Not one that was, you know, I mean, yes, you want one on, on the computer, but if the virus has already taken hold, the one on your computer is not going to be very valuable because Viruses can do lots of tricky things with regards to virus scanners and either hide their appearance, uh, essentially make themselves hard to detect. They can tell the um, virus scanner to basically move over them and keep going. So there's a lot of little tricky things that viruses can do if they've already infected your system and you have a virus scanner. Some of them can actually attach to the virus scanner. And here's the nasty thing. When you click scan my computer, it actually writes that virus to all the sections of your computer because it's attached to your virus scanner. So it's good to have one on a memory stick or a CD or DVD ROM that you can, once you have quarantined the system, put it in and run it from there. But you do wanna do regular updates on their what's called their signature file, which allows them to get the most recent viruses out on the market because I think there's roughly about 10,000 new viruses a day or something like that. It's pretty crazy. So waiting a month or three months or whatnot to upgrade your signature file on your antivirus could mean you're missing hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of viruses that are out on the markets. <clears throat> so use an external medium to run a virus scan on the computer after you've quarantined it. 
That'd be one way to do it. After that, if you have a mechanical hard drive, we do not do this to um, solid state drives, defragment the hard drive. And what this does in fancy terms is put contiguous sectors together, which is basically takes all the stuff that's supposed to be together and put it together so it's easy to find and read. Uh, this will help uh, systems run a little bit faster. You need at least 15 to 20% available drive space to be able to do this. Um, but it will improve efficiency on your drive. Next, check for space on your hard drive. If you're running low on space, it's gonna be harder um, for it to read and write. Performance is going to suffer because of this. So again, you want to try to maintain less than 80% capacity on our drives. Seems kind of weird but that allows us to have room for our page slash swap file and for defragmentation if we need to. If you're getting above that 80%, hitting that 90%, it's time to start looking for larger drives. Or maybe even a RAID. <clears throat> All right. Make sure your latest updates are installed. I know this seems kind of like, well, we had no kidding, but it is a active part of troubleshooting and there are people out there who do not like to run updates a lot. I am one of those people because updates can do bad things. So I generally wait to see if there's gonna be any issues and then I run updates. Some people are even worse than that. It got really bad at my previous company because there were updates that were six months old and we could not install them because if we did, it would affect our system so negatively that we couldn't function. So it depends on your organization. Go to task manager, determine whether there are processors that are using too much memory or CPU power, or is your CPU just locked up? It happens. <clears throat> and if it if it comes to it, you can end the process. If the process is locked up but chewing up a lot of um, processor space, we can go ahead and end it there. Now, here's the thing with Task Manager. If you do not recognize the process, do some cursory research before you end it because you can inadvertently crash your system. So make sure you can identify it first. So if it's something that's pretty common that you recognize, go ahead and you know shut it down as long as it's not a critical system. It is started. Does are you guys able to see my near pod? Okay, no, you should be good, Tavana. I haven't I haven't changed the slides since we came back yet. But um, always do your research. Make sure you're double checking processes before you end them. Here's the rub though. Um, mini viruses, when they run the programs, they will name them common program names. So like they'll use a slightly different title, but they'll name it something like Dropbox, you know, or Candy Crush or whatever. So they're gonna, they're gonna link it to a common type of file so that you're gonna be less inclined to delete and or stop the process from running. So something to keep in mind. Application issues. I don't know about y'all, but I am, it keeps me up at night wondering if I'm gonna lose my Candy Crush High School. So I wanna make sure that the application is always working at peak performance. So many um, different reasons can be, you know, that can cause problems with your uh, applications. They could be the application itself. Uh, say there was an update with the operating system on your device, yet you did not, uh, an, oper an update has not yet come out for the application. So the device gets updated, the older application cannot communicate with the newer operating system, thereby being rendered useless. <clears throat> so the application itself may be the problem just because it's not been updated. 
Anybody have old apps on their phone that they kind of liked using, but then eventually they just stopped servicing those apps. And then when the new operating systems come out, they basically just become useless. Anybody ever have that happen? And that happened with a ton of apps. Thankfully, at least, you know, half of them were free. But when, they, when they're paid apps, it just really, really gets to you, you know? Um, emulators, yeah, they're on Android, yep. It also could be hardware issues. Maybe you don't have enough resources to run the applications you wish to run. Or maybe there's other applications running that are chewing up resources that make it so that this application can't launch. Operating system, maybe the application updated, but you're like, you know what? I'm holding off on updating my uh, Windows to the new service pack because, you know, my buddy Jimmy updated it and his system is just a train wreck right now. Somebody said Windows 11 was a good idea and I just, I just don't believe it. Data. Other applications in conflict for resources, that kind of fun stuff. Or it could be <gasps> the user. It does happen. So application errors. We have a fun five-step process here. Kind of goes with our little bit along the lines of our troubleshooting. So first, interview the user. Back up the data. See if they can reproduce the problem. That's always a big one. Try to reboot it. Try to, you know, hard close, because just closing out of the app doesn't turn the app off. You actually have to shut it down. Um, try to reboot it. Try rebooting the phone. Had to do that this morning. I was, you know, working on an app. The app seized up. I, you know, closed the app in the phone, rebooted the app, didn't work. Rebooted the phone, went back to the app. App works just fine. So sometimes you have to either reboot the app or the phone itself. Two, are there any error messages? Do you not have web access? Logs might be of use. Um, Windows 7 and 8, check your Action Center for notifications. <clears throat> search the web for help because we know everything on the internet is true, right? So we search the web for help, go to forums, check it out. See if we can, um, you know, find somebody who's experiencing a similar problem and how they may have fixed it. Hint, if they say use a hammer, they're probably lying. Um, after that, use Event Viewer and check your logs and see if you can find any clues as to what might be causing the problem. Next, step three, consider the data or the application itself is corrupted. This is the case you're likely going to have to delete or uninstall that application and reinstall it or it could be just as simple as the application settings might be incorrect do you have the incorrect username and password you've done all these things it's still not working at this point maybe you have a virus system resources may be too low like you don't have enough RAM to handle all the fun applications and stuff that we want to run on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, another application may be interfering, contrary to popular belief. Some applications, even though they live on the same phone, don't get along. <clears throat> and, you know, another maybe a service for that particular application itself may not start. Could be your RAM is going bad. It does happen from time to time. Hopefully not, but it could be a corrupted hard drive. <laughs> That's kind of a really, really bad scenario. But again, remember, we try not to assume the worst when we're going in. We work our way up to that point. It doesn't mean that that point doesn't exist or doesn't happen. It may at some point. And then finally, consider that Windows may be the problem. If you have Windows 11, it highly likely is. Just saying. All right. So a problem with the application might be, you know, updating or restoring Windows system files. Those may be corrupted. Those may be recent updates where this happens a lot with Mac. Um, they like to kind of negate third party applications on a regular basis. So if there's common third party apps that are not received through the App Store uh, on regular updates, they will nuke those applications so they're not functional anymore. Um, 
So in this case, though, you know, they're saying it could be a recent, your app got updated, but not your Windows. Download your updates. Use your system file checker to verify and replace any missing, damaged, or corrupted uh, system files, you know, or roll back the clock with System Restore. Um, why would I say missing or moved or damaged system files? Or do these things kind of move on their own? What would be an indicator? What, what would my main indicator be or what would I be thinking if I have moved missing or damaged system files other than, oh no, I need to fix that one thing? Sounds like a disk error. Could be a disk error. Something more sinister. Your you hat. Virus on your PC. Some form of malware. Um, so there's a variety of different malware that we can uh, get into, and we will get into other than just viruses. But one of the easiest ways to kind of interfere with systems is to move system files to a new location. So when the system is looking for those files, they're not where they're supposed to be. Or delete them, and then you can't fix them, or, you know, and then finally corrupt them so that you can use it to spread. But that would be a higher level version. Usually it's just move them or delete them. A virus is a type of malware, but not all malware are viruses. There are a variety of categories of malware. So we will get into that when we get into security. Okay. So a virus is just one type of malware. And there is a big variety of viruses as well. So, but we will talk about that in a little bit. All right, hanging applications, use task manager to end it. Um, if you're not able to close it out, if task manager can't do it, you, you know, get your, pi your PID number, go into your command line and kill the process. Use task kill. Now there's two ways you can do it. You can do task kill space process, but that will kill all instances of it. So if you have, 32 windows of Chrome open, but only one is the problem. If you use task kill Chrome, it kills all of your Chrome applications. But if you can find the individual PID of the instance that's causing the problem, you can kill just the one version of, of Chrome that's causing the problem. So PID is more like a scalpel where you're, you know, carving out that one piece of the problem where if you're just naming the process itself, it's more like a broadsword. So you're knocking everything out that's you know, surrounding that particular process. <clears throat> so and here's some examples of the command line, task kill space, F space, or forward slash F space, forward slash PID colon 2212 and then that will kill that process in the background. Will I get practice? Is there some sort of way I can try this out on my own? Two places, actually. Test out and Coursera. So of course three of Coursera, we will get a lot more into stuff like this. You will be troubleshooting with command line in Coursera with both Windows and Linux. So again, when you're doing the Linux one, if Linux is not your primary operating system, which you're super comfortable with, I highly encourage you not to do the copy paste option and to type in so that you can kind of get a feel for what the commands are, when to use them and all that fun stuff. <clears throat> it doesn't take much longer. All right. Files failing to open. Could be the application you're trying to open it with is not installed. Uh, when I did a update from one version of Mac OS to a new version, I lost all my old um, Microsoft Office 
sweet. So I lost my PowerPoint, lost my Excel, lost my Word um, because I had an older version and they desperately wanted me to get on their subscription service. So if the application is not there, I'm not able to open it. I might be able to open it with an adjacent type of program, but it won't be the exact same, like formatting may be way off and all that kind of fun stuff. <clears throat> and it, how it determines what program to use to open it is based upon the file extension. So if it has like a dot doc, it's typically a Windows document or Microsoft, Microsoft Word. If it's a dot txt, it's a text file, dot jpg, it's a picture. So based upon these file extensions, will determine what application you're trying to use to open it. If you don't have the primary application for it, it's going to ask you maybe for a secondary one or it won't even open at all. <clears throat> so they have the ODBC tool, which can be used to allow data files to be connected to applications they normally would not use. And that's kind of where you can use different applications to open the same thing. It may not be the exact same, especially when you're talking about documents and stuff, but it will be close. And it may be enough to where you can convert the file to a different format um, so that it can be used. Like if you wanna go from Excel to Google Sheets, you know, it would allow you to make the conversion. All right. So here's what I'm talking about where you try to open something, it doesn't work because you don't have a particular program and it gives you some options of what you may use to try to interact with it. Hmm. All right. So we've talked about a few problems and what we should be using. So now we're gonna get into the tools like BIOS, UEFI, memory diagnostics, system file checker, logs, sys recovery, repair disks, uh, patches, safe mode, MS config, and the all beloved command line. So some of our first line tools, especially when dealing with hardware, if the hardware is not recognized is to go into our BIOS or UEFI. Anybody tell me what I'm looking at here? Which one am I looking at? UEFI. UEFI, how do we know? The graphic display is different. There we go. So as Jose says, it's fancy. Um, it's got uh, clickable elements. We can use a mouse. That is a, that is a surefire way to determine whether or not you are dealing with a UEFI or a BIOS. If you can use your mouse, it is UEFI. Most modern systems have been converted over to the UEFI as opposed to the BIOS. And uh, we've had some interactions with the UEFI slash BIOS in test outs. And I think there's a few more labs we'll have to deal with it, but um, I believe in there, it allows you to use your mouse. So we know for sake of this, it is a UEFI. All right, memory diagnostics. <clears throat> if we want to use this in our command prompt window or our search function, we can type in mdsched.exe. <clears throat> if the desktop will not load, you can hit your space bar during boot, and then you can select Windows Memory Diagnostics from the Windows Boot Manager screen. If you can't even boot to that, boot to the Windows Setup DVD, repair your computer, and then you can do memory diagnostics from there. What this does is basically it runs scans on your RAM and tells you if you have a problem with the memory. And this kind of allows you to eliminate the memory as one of your core issues. This is if you do not have one of those fancy RAM checkers in your, in your office, many of us don't. Um, mid to larger companies may have this, or if you have a basically a standalone computer repair store, like one of those iFix places or something, they may have uh, one of these on hand because that's their primary purpose. 
work with something like this, but this allows you to kind of eliminate that as a, as a potential issue. And you can move on to other tools like System File Checker. <clears throat> so this one kind of runs through your system files and protects them and makes sure to keep your cache current, all that kind of fun stuff. It automatically verifies uh, files after reboot to see if they were changes or unprotected copies. Um, if you run this in the elevated command prompt, what do they mean by that? I say an elevated command prompt, what am, what am I speaking of? Yeah, administrative command line. Administrative, administrative command line. How do we get there? There's a couple ways. You can act as one using sudo. In Windows? Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I know you're a Linux user, so. <laughs> you could right click on the Windows icon. Okay. And then it gives you an option to run as admin. Yes. All right. So that'd be like the primary way we would uh, we would do it. Windows 11, I believe, allows you to hover over the start window, and then you have the the option to go up and run it as admin as well. There you go. Thank you, Jose. So once we do that, we get into our command prompt. We can run, you can go SFC or system file checker forward slash scan now, and it'll go ahead and scan our systems. Um, if there are corrupted system files, uh, Windows might need to set up uh, DVD uh, to restore files. May need to set up DVD to restore files. This is one you can run on your own if you have a Windows machine. Go in there and just try to practice it. See if it, uh, you can find any issues with your computer. <clears throat> if it won't run, you can try the command SFC or system file checker forward slash scan once. And then what it'll do is, is it'll run the scan after you reboot. So if you can't run the scan immediately, it'll set it up so that it runs the next time you reboot your system. Um, I believe so. Yes, Jose. I believe if you're in recovery mode, yeah, you are running it as admin. All right, logs. They love asking this question. Where would I find the logs for this? Where would I find the logs for that? Where would I go looking for logs? It's always um, event viewer. You may have three questions around that same exact phrasing. Where do I go to find the logs for blank? Event viewer is always the answer. So like we said, operating system com com uh, collects information about events, all the events, everything you open, everything you touch, who logged in, what do they do? All that fun stuff. It may not be detailed like every, you know, it's not gonna be like every website you go to kind of thing, but it's basically you opened up Internet Explorer, X amount of data was transmitted, and you know, and then it was closed at this time. So it's going to keep logs of all programs and interactions that happen on the system. So there's different types of logs that can be maintained. You have security logs, application logs, system logs, admin logs, all that kind of fun stuff. These files um, can be used to kind of track down issues where they occurred, where did they start. On an individual computer, you're looking for specific applications where it may have run. On a network, you may be looking for how did the trouble start on the network. So if you have a virus running rampant through the system, you want to be able to track down the source. Where did it come in? When did these events occur? And our ability to do that is completely surrounding our logs. We would basically be backtracking through time to find out what was the first system corrupted. And then we can go in there and individually look at the logs in that system and we can see when the infection occurred and what did they do? Was it based upon a single email? Did they click on a hyperlink? Did they download a file? So logs are extremely useful in that sense.
And there are third party programs out there that will help you sift through the data and make the logs a lot easier to kind of manage rather than going through every single one piece by piece trying to figure out what occurred. Although understanding the time when events occurred will help you narrow down your search drastically. Questions on this? Yes, you can export logs, but don't delete logs. That's considered very bad form. And that's like instantaneously uh, being looked at through the lens of guilt if you were the one deleting logs. So the, the immediate response is, what are you hiding? So. Do the logs delete you deleting logs? Do the logs what? Do they log you deleting logs? I imagine, uh, yeah, there is logs, you know, like you you have modified set files and they can go in and see when the files are modified. And so, yeah. So then it's like, I don't know if it keeps, creates that, you know, recursive loop where it's like such and such deleted logs, such and such deleted a log file of deleting logs, such and such deleted a log file of a log file deleting log, you know, so I don't know if it would create something like that, but um, yeah, there is, you know, interactions that would be done. It's log inception. Basically, how many layers deep do we want to go? All right, so this is kind of your system recovery options here that we were talking about before. Um, you have older versions look like this. There's a more um, like Windows 8, Windows 10 version looks like this. And then Windows 11, I believe, has a newer um, version of it as well. And in here, it's gonna give you a variety of options, system restore, you know, boot from an image, startup repair, command prompt, all that kind of fun stuff where you can go in and do more troubleshooting and or repair system issues. <clears throat> so some of the options to get into system repair, it's kind of a do it all. It, it performs a number of repairs when you do it. It looks for registry files that are corrupted. Uh, and it goes basically to your backup copy in your hard drive from your recovery partition and will try to repair it. It'll restore critical boot files, which is really nice. It'll look for critical system and driver files. You know, roll back any non-working drivers, which is pretty awesome. If you have any incompatible service, service packs or patches on there, it'll go ahead and uninstall those, give you free up some disk space and possibly negate any conflicts run a check disk to see if your hard drive has any bad sectors on it and do a full RAM test to see if your memory is working properly. So it fixes most of your boot problems. So not a bad one to use <clears throat> and minimal risk in using it. You know, System restore, we've talked about this before, kind of rolls back you know, the clock a little bit on your system files. So if you've updated a service pack that was bad or added applications that are causing all sorts of problems, you can utilize system restore to go back in time to previous settings. Bad thing on system restore, if you get infected by a virus, they can, one of the primary targets they attack first is your system restore capabilities. So they wanna go in there and embed themselves in your system restore. So even if you roll back the clock, you still have the infection. So it's not a bulletproof fail safe, but it does work in a lot of cases outside of the malware arena. Questions on this? Well, the best thing for that is to like use a backup off the of USB. For your system restore? Yeah. That'd be one way to do it. Yeah. Or have a, um, whenever you do system updates and stuff like that, have an image created. Because, yeah, I mean, that would be something like you're talking about. You can create an image onto your disk and that would allow you to boot to that image and 
bypass a lot of these issues. And then you would need to run a, um, your data backup and go ahead and restore all your files and stuff like that. So that's, this is where um, I'm getting some of my classes confused here. So system recovery would handle your system files and you would have data backup to handle all your, you know, music, movies, documents, and all that kind of fun stuff. So you would need both of those things. So you had that image, which would basically work in lieu of system restore to bring your system back up to speed. And then you would use your data backup on a hard drive to restore all your files and documents and stuff. Okay. Sense? Yes. Well, kind of, but yes, I'm getting it. Yeah. Mac has Time Machine. Time Machine does all that in one. So you restore all of that stuff at one point. And the nice thing about Time Machine is I can go in to the Time Machine and pull out individual documents if I have a problem, as opposed to just create, you know, re-implementing the entire backup just to get that one document. I could go in and just pull out the one document. So it has a little bit more functionality. But we'll get into the system restore problem a little bit more when we talk about malware. That's coming up probably in about two weeks or so. <clears throat> Image recovery. So this is kind of what we're talking about. So if your system restore didn't work, uh, you had a bad malware infection, and this is a bad way to go because it's just going to reinfect your system regardless. Um, you can create an image um, and then utilize that image to run a backup on it or implement it. So, or again, if you want to use the same image for, you know, like all of HR, if you're setting up HR systems, you would create an image for them and you would deploy that image to every single computer. This is where you would do it from system image recovery. And you would deploy all the images and it would give all the settings and capabilities that you would need um, in one file. And it would be done a lot more efficiently than you going through and doing those settings manually every time. Next. Repair disk, not as common today, again, because DVDs are kind of going away. Um, it allows you to recover a computer and bring it back to the point where it was when it was brand new, essentially the king method. Um, can only be used to reinstall the operating system on the PC itself. Uh, Windows Backup Restore tool allows you to create a system repair disk if you wish on Windows 7, although we're not really worrying about Windows 7. Um, and then there's basically the instructions to create a repair disk if you so choose. <clears throat> 32 versus 64-bit patches. 32 is kind of going away as of Windows 11. That's the first operating system in the Windows family to not have a 32-bit option. Um, so that's kind of going by the wayside. And as we talked about in earlier technical sessions, when they refer to 32-bit architecture, they usually refer to it as x86. And then when they were referring to 64-bit, they refer to it as X64. If the architecture and the chip allows for both, they will have 86 slash 64 um, on the file to indicate that the processor can handle either or. So 32-bit installation of Windows, you need a 32-bit patch, device driver, and applications. 64-bit, you need a 64-bit device driver but applications can be 32 or 64 bit. Remember, we can make a Ferrari drive like a Honda. We cannot make a Honda drive like a Ferrari. I'm glad you guys are implementing this stuff while you're, we're talking, that's awesome. All right, boot to safe mode. So when you boot to safe mode, this basically, you know, you probably have problems with drivers. It may be your graphics card, any of that kind of fun stuff. It allows you to boot with only the most basic drivers to run like your keyboard, your mouse storage and stuff like that. Then you can get in there and start actually troubleshooting. So you're, you're, you're going to go way back in time to the, you know, late 90s windows looking like, you know, like I said, 
Nintendo's 16-bit graphics, but it allows you to go in, turn things on one at a time, and kind of see where the problems are lying. Um, so if your graphics card doesn't work, it allows you to go in, change the settings, turn off the graphics card, and use your onboard graphics card uh, rather than the GPU that you installed. And then you can boot back into regular Windows, operate semi-normally until you can replace the graphics card if the graphics card is dead, if it's not functioning properly. MS config kind of helps you start a lot uh, or troubleshoot a lot of your startup problems. Um, so you can go through, you can disable individual items that are normally executed at startup, like we were talking about when you install software. Companies like to go, hey, just for your convenience, I'm going to go ahead and add myself to that list because I know I am now your most important piece of software that you're going to use every single day. <laughs> And uh, so you can go in here and you can turn off specific functions so that they do not start at startup and it can make your startup start a lot faster, a lot cleaner and save you a lot of time on your day-to-day -day, um, boot ups. Because if, if anybody who owns a Windows machine knows this, after about a year or two, <clears throat> it takes forever for those things to boot because of all the bloatware that's typically in your startup menus. So time to time, go in there, clean it up, especially if you're installing things, you know, on a cave. So no mini command for this one. So you can go to your search function and just type in msconfig and it will, and it will kick it off for you. Command prompt. Allows you to run multiple utilities simultaneously. We get to this by typing in CMD in our search function, or uh, we can run it from our start menu, right click it to run it as an administrator if we wish, and run whatever commands we wish. But we'll get a little bit more practice with the command line as we go along. Uh, we talked about trace routes, ping, and all that fun stuff already, correct? Okay. I've slept since then, so I may not remember. All right, and that actually does bring us to the end of our presentation. Bit of a long one this morning. So now we should be able to identify some common issues that occur with Windows, few with uh, Mac or Linux, troubleshooting applications we can use um, to solve these problems, describe and resolve some common issues that we may experience on a regular basis, some of the most common ones and talk about which system utilities, tools, and command line to utilize for given scenarios. Questions, comments, concerns? That is awesome. There we go. All right. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints. All right.